Today we're going to be talking about chapter seven, interpersonal relationships. So the first thing that we need to know about interpersonal relationships is that it's interactions between two people. So this is how we start, build, maintain, and sometimes end or redefine relationships. And we do that through our communication. So interpersonal relationships, just to define that first, that are that's defined by um, sets of expectations that we have for people. So um, if you are in a relationship, romantic relationship with somebody, you have certain expectations for them. Uh, a friend, you might have different expectations. Family member, you might have different expectations. But basically, um, in all of those situations, all those relationships, you communicate on a regular basis and you also have certain expectations between you. So um, this, these are formed as one interacts with others verbally and non-verbally through face-to-face -face and technological channels. So basically every time that you text, call, see someone face-to-face, -face, interact with someone, you're building upon these expectations. And they also satisfy an innate need to feel connected with others. This is talking about you, these interpersonal relationships. All of us have a need to feel connected to others. But that might vary how great we need that. Like we might not, some of us may need lots of friends and need to be very active while other people maybe pretend to like to have a few, a few friends and um, kind of just like to hang out with them or maybe their family, you know, maybe they're not so much that they want to go out and do a bunch of stuff, but they um, just like to stay kind of close knit, right? So we may have different levels of that, but we all have a different, we all have an innate sense of wanting to feel connected to others. And so what we're all desiring is for our relations, our interpersonal relationships to be healthy. And so a healthy relationship is interactions in the relationships that satisfy all those involved, meaning that the communication pattern that you have is going to satisfy both people, not one person and the other person doesn't get to share their thoughts or vice versa. Um, just making sure that you're both getting what you need out of the relationship. So there's two, three types of relationships that we encounter, and that's first acquaintances, friends, and intimates. And so starting with acquaintances, these are individuals whom we know by name, so we have interaction with them, but they're not necessarily people we have deep conversations with. We have more of what is called impersonal communication, so this is going to be surface level chit chat, right? So maybe this is somebody at work that you're friends with and you know them, um, but you don't know them very well, so you just kind of you know, talk about what you can think of, maybe the weather that day or, um, you know, something to do with work, but you really don't know a whole lot about each other otherwise. And so the goal during this communication, this communication is to reduce uncertainty. So just like every relationship, we've talked about this a lot in several of the other chapters, but whenever we communicate with, with others, we want to reduce uncertainty, meaning that we want to feel like we know how to communicate with that person and also um, saving face. So this is, you know, wanting to have a self image a positive self-image of yourself and trying to make sure that that continues as you com converse with this person. So whenever we're dealing with acquaintanceships, we want to think about these things. We want to initiate conversations. So some of us, I um, in class, I tend to ask people, do you feel like you're an initiator or someone that allows people to initiate with you? A lot of people tend to say, that, oh, I, I don't necessarily initiate the conversation. I wait till the other person does. Well, it's important to, at times, when the, it's appropriate, to initiate conversations. That's a polite thing to do. And then um, we want to make sure that when we do this, and when we do have these interactions with, acquaintance, with acquaintances, we want to make sure that we make relevant comments. So you want to make sure whatever they're talking about, that you talk about that too. You don't want to just kind of switch what they're talking about to whatever you want to talk about, right? Which is why we want to develop other centered focus, meaning that when we communicate, we're focused on the other person, we're listening, and we're responding appropriately, and we're doing what is called um, appropriate turn taking. So you want to make sure that you're listening and you're, you know, you're giving feedback, but you're not the only person communicating, or you're not the only, you're not making it where the only the other person talks. That's also not good, right? We don't want to kind of be the person that just seems closed off and doesn't and like doesn't say anything. You want to make sure that you do have some appropriate turn taking. And then, of course, in all situations, you want to be polite. You want to make sure you don't say anything offensive. And so, most of the time, that's pretty obvious, but you just want to be aware of that. Okay, so now the next level that we have is called friends. And friends are people whom we ha one has involuntarily negotiated more personal relationships. So basically, you are one, you have more of a context with this person, you have maybe more interactions, you've gotten to know them on a deeper level, you have more topics maybe that you'll, you'll talk about. 
Um, so maybe if you had kind of an acquaintance at work, that might just be somebody that you pass. Like for me, I have acquaintances at work. I see a certain teacher or to certain instructors when I go to the office and uh, maybe I make my lunch in the workroom. I see one or two people who tend to make their lunch at the same time, but they're not in my department and I don't see them very often. So I might know their name, but I really don't know and, and what they teach, but that's really it. So then when we talk, it's just kind of like, oh yeah, you know, today's crazy or oh, the weather or whatever. I mean, I'm always surprised one person asked me that how my son was doing. I was like, oh wow, I can't believe that you knew that I have a son. You know, that was more of a, the, an acquaintance. But then I have the there's then there's another level of people that I actually would refer to as my friends, like my work friends. That's what this is talking about. These are often referred to in context. So like I have several friends at work that I don't necessarily hang out with outside of work. But when I'm at work, I actively seek them out and go and talk with them and um, communicate with them and ask them about their day and ask them about things that's going on in their lives and tell them about things in mine. And so there's kind of those, that difference, right? I know a couple of people by their name and by their department, but that's about it. This next level of friendship would be more so like, I know them, we have more con things that we talk about, a broader breadth, you could say, of topics, we go a little deeper, um, and I actively seek them out. So some friendship guidelines that we want to be aware of is that again, you want to initiate conversations. Like I said, I, I go, I often go and I seek out certain people and ask them how their day is going and just ask them about certain things going on. I just make sure that I'm initiating conversations and then actively listen and respond. So I shouldn't go into these conversations just waiting to talk. I should want to listen as well. So you want to listen and respond appropriately. And then engage in self disclosure. What's another thing that um, I think is important is that. I should, that and you should be giving some information about ourselves and try not to be too, like, too surface level, right? I mean, sometimes it's going to be in certain situations, but there's a point that you should share some information. Self-disclosure is the only way that we can grow closer to people. So you do want to self-disclose. You do want to tell about yourself some. You just don't want it to be the only focus. Um, then we also want to provide emotional support. So when they're going, somebody's going through something, we want to be there for them. I know that like one of my coworker friends, he was talking just about how we had a lot going on this semester. He was really stressed. And he, I was just there saying, like, I totally understand. I'm so sorry. If I can help you, let me know. I'm going through the same thing. You know, I'm just there to emotionally help and support him. And then manage conflict. So there's going to be conflicts in every friendship, especially if you're friends long enough. So conflict isn't necessarily bad. I think people view that as a bad word, right? Like, oh, I just, you know, I avoid conflict. I mean, I think that's because when we think of conflict, we think of it as only a fight. Um, and that does not have to be what conflict is. And so in the next chapter, we'll talk more about conflict, but you do want to manage your, here I'm just going to say we want to manage our conflicts in a healthy way. <clears throat> okay, so intimate relationships. So intimates are our close and personal friends. These are the people that in all contexts, you would say these are my closest people, um, is your best friends, maybe your romantic partner, your your family, you know, this is the people that you would say this is like, this is my group, right? Um, so you share a high degree of understanding, self-disclosure, commitment, interdependence, trust, and affection with these people. So like I said, it can be platonic, like a friendship or a family member, or it can be romantic, either one. Um, but one of the main things that it's characterized by is trust. So we have, we would need to be able to, for an intimate relationship to work, be able to place confidence in another person, right? We have to be able to believe in, that they, we can tell them things, we have to believe that we can trust them. Um, but as always, it's always going to involve some risk, uh, but we have to decide if that we're willing to take that risk or not. So as always, intimacy decreases if the partner proves to be untrustworthy. Obviously, that's going to happen. That's going to make the intimacy not be as close when that happens. And then a severe breach of trust can also end a relationship. If there's something that's a big enough deal that someone um, either shares or does that you have an intimate relationship with, and that's something that you really thought they wouldn't do, and then they did it, that's going to sometimes cause a breach in the friendship and make, make the relationship end altogether. All right, so intimate relationships are based on several things, physical touch, sharing of ideas, opinions, and important feelings, participating in shared activities. So 
the physical touch thing, you know, especially in romantic relationships, that's going to be the case, but also just even thinking about like, if you hug people or not, right. That's, that's part of like, even in your platonic relationships, you're going to hug, touch, pat them on the back, do those kinds of things. Also just be physically closer to one another, right. You're, we're willing to be closer to people that we're more in, like that we have more of a relationship with. And then sharing of ideas, opinions, and important feelings. The only way, like I said earlier, is, is to self-disclose, to share things. The more that we share, the more the feelings and the opinions and important things in our lives that we share with people, the closer that relationship will be. And then also you need to participate in shared activities. So spending time with each other, um, not spending enough time with each other is going to affect your relationship. So we want to make sure that we plan shared activities. And then once cultural identity may influence the type of interaction one engages in, um, absolutely, depending on the where you grew up and the culture you grew up in, that's going to dictate how you treat others in intimate relationships, what's appropriate, what would be awkward, all those things. You want to think about that. Um, so intimacy develops norm, development norms differ across cultures and are becoming less prominent. So it kind of just depends on where you grew up, like I said, um, in the norm that y'all established. So each relationship, too, that you have will maybe have different norms. And so that's kind of different as well. And then guidelines, be dependable, responsive, responsive, collaborative, faithful, transparent, and willing. So dependable, that's something I feel like when I was younger, I wasn't as good about. Like when I was in college, I feel like I wasn't as dependable of, as a friend of a friend. I, I did too many things. I had my hands in too many things. I had so many friends. I had just so many things I was doing. And I felt like it made me not as dependable as, uh, as I am now, but as uh, you know, back then I feel like I just couldn't be anyone's best friend or just a really good friend because I wasn't dependable for them. Um, or sorry, let me say that. I wasn't someone they could depend on. And then also responsive. So make sure that you respond to people, that you think about how you respond, that you respond promptly, that you care, uh, you show that you care in your responses. How we respond to people is really gonna dictate how close our relationship is. And then collaborative. So this is means like we'll talk more about collaboration in the next chapter. But again, this is talking just about growing, being able to communicate about a lot of things, sharing our feelings, discussing, working together to figure things out. Faithful, obviously, especially in, um, in romantic relationships, you want to think about that. You want to be faithful. Um, and then transparent. So being open, honest is huge in relationships. The more open and honest we can be, the closer we feel to somebody. And then willing means willing to sacrifice for that person, willing to um, to try for the relationship, to um, try to understand the other person, to sacrifice maybe some things that you want for that person and what they need. Um, but it's just a, a willingness to do what it takes for the relationship. OK, so in a lot of these, I talked about self-disclosure, self-disclosure, just sharing information. That's basically what we're going to talk about now. So disclosure has a lot to do with a relationship life cycle. So people often probably think that once you get to a certain level with someone that, you know, you're just close. And in some ways, yes, but in a lot of ways, a relationship will have a life cycle. So it kind of move back and forth between different phases, depending on the amount of disclosure that's being given, how much time you're spending together, all of those things. And this disclosure can and feedback those kind of those two things go hand in hand, sharing information, but also listening to others and giving feedback. So there's two ways of, that we disclose. First, we can either self-disclose, so this is information about ourselves, or we can self-disclose, or we can disclose others other information or other disclosure, centered disclosure that is going to be more about information being shared about a third party. So like if I'm upset at my husband and I decide to share that with my friend and ask her her advice, I'm self-disclosing some information, but I'm also other disclosing, meaning I'm, I'm disclosing information about my husband as well. So you want to be careful about what you disclose about others, right? Um, you don't want to breach any trust there, but you just want to make sure like sometimes that's important and you do need to do that. Um, whenever with the people that you're disclosing to. Okay, so social penetration theory. So this is another part of about disclosure. So th this particular theory talks about how self-disclosure kind of string out grows in your in different relationships. So like somebody, for example, if you look at the page, let's see what page it's on. Okay, if you look at page 86, there's a wheel. Let's see if I can show you. There's a wheel here. Kind of see how that works. 
And it's basically just saying that as you get to know somebody, you you start to grow in the breadth or uh, of topics, meaning the number of topics that you'll talk about. And you'll also talk about, you also go deeper. So there's a depth there, right? When you first get to know somebody, there might only be a few topics and you might not go very deep, but as you start to get to know someone more, more topics are brought to the table. You go deeper and deeper with the, with maybe what you've already shared with them. Um, and that's going to show, kind of show like the social penetration here, how you, how you grow with someone, but then also it can show you how you kind of move backwards with someone. Like if there's less things you talk about, you don't go as deep with that person. That means you're not going to be as close with them. The next thing that is shown in the book, I think it's on page 87, is the Jahari window. And so this is a, just another theory about how we disclose information. So when you get to know someone, you have this box. So you had the first box, you have this open category. So this is stuff that you, these are topics you're willing to talk about. You're willing to, so like me, I tell, told you I grew up in North Little Rock. I went to North Little Rock High School. So I'm telling you this information. That means since I'm willing to tell you that, that's in our open category, right? But then, you know, so say you have some topics you're willing to talk with someone that you're getting to know. Well, then there's also this secret box, meaning things that y'all haven't discussed yet. Maybe some of that is secret, like you don't know if you want to share it with that person. Also, some of it's just that maybe y'all haven't talked about it yet. Like maybe if it was you and I becoming friends, you may not have known that I did cheer there and I really loved it and I did drama and I was really, you know, those, I may not have shared that with you yet. So it's in my secret box, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's a secret. Like I wouldn't tell you, it's just not something we've discussed yet. Right. But then there's also things that maybe I wouldn't want to share because our relationship's not deep enough to want to share it with you yet. And then that would be kind of a secret to me. Okay. So anyway, so that's open box and the secret box. And then the blind box is means that things that you don't realize that about yourself that other people do. So maybe somebody, you don't really realize that you often cut people off when they're talking. You're not a very good listener. Maybe you don't really realize that, you know, you're blind to that. But the person that you're friends with knows that about you and that's part of what they know. Um, and maybe they, that maybe they haven't necessarily discussed it with you yet, which is what makes it blind. You're still blind to it, but they know it about you. But then say one day they tell you about it and they're like, hey, just so you know, like you tend to do this a lot. When they do that, they are move, if they're moving this topic, this topic about you, you know, cutting people off, they're moving that from the blind sec box to the open box. And by doing that now, that is an open, hopefully an open category that y'all can talk about. And then there's an unknown box. So this is, that kind of seem kind of silly to you, but it's the unknown is basically just what you may not know about yourself and therefore you can't communicate about it yet and therefore others can't know it about you. Like you've, if you've never been ziplining, you may not know that that's something you like. So you can't tell someone if you like it or not. Then when you go ziplining, then maybe you could tell somebody that you like it or not. So then maybe it moves to the secret box because you haven't shared it yet. But then you see your friend you haven't seen in a while and then you tell them you go ziplining. Well, then that moves it up to the open box. Right. So you see how they all kind of shift. So as you grow closer, hopefully more things go to the open box. And you're able to talk more about a lot of things. People you don't know as well, you're going to have a smaller open box, a, small, a fewer categories in that open box. Because either one, you just haven't had time to share it yet. Or two, that's just not in the topics that you have, um, that you've discussed yet. Or three, you don't feel comfortable sharing it. Right. So as your relationship grows, you'll see how that kind of changes and morphs. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the stages of relationships. So there's the coming together stage, staying together, and the coming apart stage. Um, so for the beginning and developing phases, this is where communication is mainly aimed at reducing uncertainty. So this is what we're just trying to get to know someone. We're asking, probably asking a lot of questions, maybe sharing information about ourselves, just trying to open up, get to know somebody. Um, this is what also is like another theory or I guess a model that's used sometimes is the relationship filtering model. It's right here on page 88. And you see how it looks kind of like a funnel. And basically there's all these different levels that we go through when we're getting to know somebody. So say you're in a group of classmates and you're kind of looking around and you kind of decide based just on appearance, you know, who do I want maybe to sit by or who do I want to talk to? And so you sit by that person and you decide to talk to them and then you get to know like a little bit more about them. And the more simple, like, you'll kind of go through these filters as you get to know somebody, you'll, they'll go through all these different filters. And if they make it all the way through all the filters, then you'll decide to probably be close with that person. 
if they don't make it through all the filters, then you will probably not want to be posed. So I would definitely read more about that in the book because I think that's very interesting. That I think that really affects a lot of our relationships more than we realize, especially relationships when we're getting to know people. Um, but it also has a lot to do with self-disclosure. So in each of these levels, you're going to be self-disclosing, telling people what you really think about things. You know, you have to self-disclose in order to move through the funnel, in order for people to get to know you better and you to get to know others in order for you even to decide if you want to pursue friendship or relationship or whatever with somebody. Okay, so then um, disclosure and feedback allows an individual to identify and capitalize on similarities. So whenever we share information about ourselves, it also helps you capitalize on things that are similar. So like a lot of times when you're talking with someone, you're just trying to figure out what do we have in common so we can talk about those things, right? So that's good. We want to find that. But also it's there. You're also able to kind of realize your differences and either decide if you could tolerate that or maybe negotiate those things or if you can't tolerate it, right? You can kind of understand this, but we have to self-disclose in order for that to happen. And then again, culture obviously is going to engage or going to impact that. And then um, many engage and come together via social media. Like if you think about a lot of people meet now over social media or through dating apps or whatever, but there's a lot more ways to get to know people than just the people physically right in front of you. So social media has kind of opened that door a bit for us. So the next stage is maintaining relationships. So relational maintenance, maintenance is absolutely dependent upon communication, how much you communicate with someone. If you have friendships that have kind of faded in your life, or you're like, oh, you know, I haven't, I wonder what's going on with them. I haven't talked to them in a while. Well, the reason why that friendship has faded is because you haven't communicated, you haven't talked. And that's important in order for a relationship to continue and to ma be maintained, you must communicate. Um, so you might have to sacrifice some things for that. You have to be willing to sacrifice some things for your friendship. And sometimes that's just time and energy, right? I mean, being able to like, say it's a Wednesday and your friend needs you like, Hey, would you mind going and, you know, getting a drink or getting eat, going to eat with me real quick? I just, you know, I went through something at work and I just really need to talk to somebody, you know, and maybe you were planning to have a night in, but you're like, well, I can do that. I'm not really busy tonight. I'll do that. But you have to sacrifice maybe your night in. Um, for that person because you know they've gone through something, right? So you do have to have some kind of sacrifices in relationships in order to maintain them. Um, and then again, conflict is inevitable. And this does not mean that it's bad. It's not bad to have conflict. It's when we handle conflict in an inappropriate way or in a damaging way that it can be harmful to a relationship. But I think sometimes people just don't know how to handle conflict well. And so that's why they just avoid it or they don't like it or, you know, whatever. But there's positive ways to deal with conflict. And we'll talk about that next chapter. OK, stages of communication in declining relationships. So these are the stages when a relationship is getting to the declining stage, the ending stage. This is what it kind of goes through. So you have circumscribing. So this is um, communication decreases in both quantity and quality. So basically you're not talking as much and you're not talking as deep about as many things as deeply you know that's kind of like the social penetration theory i talked about you can be moving you can be going deeper by adding more topics and going deeper on the conversation but if a relationship's declining it kind of goes the opposite way you start talking about less topics and let know less about each other you start sharing less to the, with the other person that's circumscribing and then you have stagnating and this is where partners interact without enthusiasm or emotion it's just kind of like you're just there you know, there's not a whole lot of emotion either way with it. And then there's avoiding. So partners, partners avoid interacting or spending time with each other. So then you stop spending as much time. You're not making active attempts to make time for one, one another. And then after that, there is terminating. So partners do not interact with each other anymore. Um, sometimes with terminating too, it can just be that it is more of a shift of a relationship, which I think we'll talk about in a minute. Um, so along with dissolving relationships, there's different ways that we end this. So grave dressing is the attempt to express why the relationships failed. That can be done in a good way or, or in a healthy way or in an unhealthy way. Sometimes and more often than not, we, this is where sometimes we just kind of withdraw or we avoid or replace blame. Um, but you can sometimes have an appro appropriate way of grave dressing of, of ending a relationship in a way that's very direct, open and honest, that's still considerate of the other person. Um, that is the way that we want to handle the ending of our relationships. And then relationship transformation. This is um, when our, sometimes in 
when certain relationships end, they can be transformed. So say you were dating somebody, but then y'all's relationship ended and now you can be friends. Um, or say like several of my friends have gotten divorced, but they have kids and they want to be effective co-parents. So maybe they, in their marriage ended, so that relationship ended, but it didn't necessarily mean they stopped communicating. It just um, transformed their relationship, right? So now they have a co-parenting relationship versus a married relationship. All right, so there are these things called relational dialects and interpersonal relationships, and these are basically just different tensions that we have that you often feel within a relationship. So um, a dialectic is just a tension between conflicting forces, and some of these are, and you'll recognize many of them in your, maybe your own relationships that you may feel, um, but some of these tensions are autonomy versus connection, so meaning that you want to feel independent, but you also desire to feel close to somebody and make decisions together. Um, you know, there, or you know, it could be you. You personally might be struggling with this, but also it might be one partner wants to be closer or make or sorry, more connected, make more decisions together, spend more time together. The other person might desire a little bit more autonomy, a little bit more me time, um, a little more time to do what they would like to do, um, and so that would be one tension. And then there's openness and closeness. So openness is the desire to share intimate ideas and feelings with some with your partner. And then closeness would be the desire to maintain privacy. Sometimes it might be a desire. Sometimes it might just be it makes them uncomfortable to share a lot of feelings and thoughts and opinions. So um, that could be one partner wanting one way and the other one wanting the other. Or also could just be you could have that conflicting within you. Like you want to share something. You also want to just be able to kind of think about things and Keep it to yourself if you want to. Um, and then there's not novel, novelty, I almost said novelty, <laughs> novelty and predictability. Um, novelty is just wanting, desiring originality, freshness, you know, and uniqueness. Like this is basically what you feel in the beginning stages of a relationship. Um, so it's normal to kind of desire that, to want that uniqueness and that freshness. Um, but then, then there's also predictability. So the desire for consistency, reliability, uh, dependability, some people might say comfort. Um, those are also those are two things I think people feel a lot. You can kind of feel like you can want that, that comfort and that predictability and that consistency, but you might also desire some freshness and some uniqueness, something new in your relationship. Or it might be that one person feels that way and the other person is totally happy with their you know, with the, with the relationship as it is. So again, this is also always just kind of some different tensions that are going on in relationships, either within yourself or between two people. All right, so some ways that you can manage this dialectical, these dialectical tensions are several different things. You can first um, use temporal selection and that's choosing a desire to and ignoring the other. And you can only do this for so long, but maybe you decide that you want to try to, um, I don't know, you want to try to be more open. So you said you would try to share more information and you do that and you do that for the other person because that's really what they want. But maybe you can only do that for a while and then you kind of go back to like, okay, but I feel more comfortable not necessarily sharing about everything. So again, temporal selection is good because you want to make sure that you're meeting something for that from the other person or even for yourself. Um, but sometimes it's not something you can maintain forever. And then there's topical segmentation. Um, that is choosing different topics to satisfy different dialectical tensions. So kind of picking and choosing different areas that you want to um, try to satisfy. So maybe you can't satisfy everything, but so like say for um, wanting uniqueness versus comfortability, you know, like you might try to try to pick some things, like you might try to do new dates or try to make a list of things that you've never done before that you want to try to do, that might be good. And then there's neutralization, so finding a compromise between the needs of both partners. So kind of trying to find the middle ground. Um, if one person wants to spend more time together and the other person wants more alone time, maybe you could find some like a balance of like, okay, maybe on Saturday mornings you can go work out by yourself. And then maybe on Thursdays, let's just have, plan to have like movie night that night each week. You know, so finding a way to kind of satisfy both partners. And then there's reframing, and this is the changing changing the perception of the issue so that, that it is less contradictory. So this might be you just changing your opinion of, you know, uniqueness and freshness and whether or not what that is the most important thing or comfortability is the most comfortable. I don't say comfortability, but like the 
um, being able to dependability, you know, all those feelings, like you're trying to kind of change your perception. So you're not thinking of it as an either or, like either it is a fresh new relationship or it is just going to be like a relationship I've just been in forever. There's no freshness. Understand that there can be a blend of that and trying to change your perception or try to understand where the other person's coming from. Um, I think the book gave an example of, oh, what did it say? Something about how you refer, oh, like if they, if one person feels like, oh, I want to share more about, share more about things together. I want to be more open. While the other person says, I think we're open enough and y'all talk about that. And then you realize, actually, you do keep some things to yourself. Like maybe you don't always talk about um, what you do at work, but you don't really necessarily care to talk about that. Or that's something you've never thought about that you, you really haven't talk to your partner about. So then you realize, okay, we're, uh, it can be okay to keep some things in and not have to talk about everything. You know, if I kind of find this, not necessarily just a middle ground, but like your perception actually changes on how you feel about the tension. Okay, so mediated communication and in interpersonal relationships. So mediated communication is talking about, you know, any way that we use technology to build and maintain a relationship. So hyperpersonal communication, online interaction. So this, there's a lot more of this. Um, it also has a lot to do with how you present yourself. So there's a lot of self-presentation going on, on online, like any of your social media platforms or if any time that you're online for anything, you are kind of presenting this self-presentation to people. So uh, that is one part of our interpersonal relationships. Many of us are friends with people online. So we have the face-to-face, -face, but we also have that online friendship as well. Social media makes it easier to stay connected, which is great and helps us maintain relationships where they may have fallen apart because we maybe weren't close anymore, like a friend moved away or something along that line, or and you don't talk every single day, but you can kind of keep up with their life through social media. So technology um, relations are being characterized by media multiplexity. So well, that media multiplexity is using more than one medium to maintain relationships. So like I said earlier, you no longer just have face to face or over the phone or something like that, but you have social media, you have emails, you have anything that's technology. That's going to be a new way that you have that's another level of multiplexity, right? Like you have all these different mediums in which you maintain a relationship. Um, technology platform chosen to communicate may have social, emotional, and moral implications. So polymedia, how navigating among various technologies influence relationship formation and development. So how you communicate with people through technological um, devices that is going to change, that is going to communicate certain things. So like um, liking people's pictures, commenting, how you do all those things is important. Do you watch their stories or not? Like all of that, like that dictates almost a level of friendship now. So oh, if you unfriend somebody, if you block somebody, if you whatever, like all those things determine relationships. So this like the next sentence says technology is often used to uh, disengage from relationships. That's another new thing that's kind of become apparent is that sometimes people just don't like they they remove people as friends or they block people or they stop watching each other's stories or they stop interacting at all through social media to show where the relationship's at or to just like disengage with someone completely. Okay, so when using these different forums, um, technological forums, you have to understand that there is some virtual miscommunication that can happen. So we want to reduce that by speaking the right language. So you understand what forum are you on or what kind of technology are you on? And how are you, it's the correct way to speak through that. Um, amplify the signal, is respond promptly. Um, so you want to try your best to get to people quickly, avoid sloppy emailing. Uh, you don't want to send emails, especially at work in a way that sounds like, especially I will say I get a lot of emails from students, not calling anybody out, but where they don't refer to me, you know, by my name, they just kind of, they use slang in your, if you do that, that's not the way you should actually like send an email to a professor. So you should think about this as a business type email. You want to be respectful. You want to use proper grammar proper syntax you want to you know use all the like the proper things because sloppy emailing kind of communicates the wrong message to people um, and then encourage everyone to expect problems understand that there's going to be issues anytime and just let people know that communicate that if there is an issue let them know and apologize okay well that is it for chapter seven